All right, we are live. I'm going to give people a couple minutes to, to show up, but All right, I'm chilling. So whenever y'all want to start, just take off. Okay. All right. Uh, give them a couple more minutes and then I'll start with the intros. All right, I think it's time to get started. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Youth Driven Substance Abuse Conference, known as Walking the Red Road Together. My name is Chris Shaw. I am the Prevention Coordinator here at Two Feather Native American Family Services, and I am your guys' host for the week. Um, we are happy to be back. We have a really, really fun and unique uh, experience for you guys today. Uh, we have coming back two of our youth who you guys may have saw on Monday. But um, if you don't, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. I'll, uh, I'll start with Joe today. Joe, uh, tell us a little about yourself and uh, tell us how you're doing today. What's up, Chris? Um, I'm doing good today. Uh, I was just a little frustrated. I had to wake up this morning. No, I like I just kid. But anyway, uh, yeah, my name's Joseph Lewis. I'm 17 years old. Um, I'm of Ohupa and Yurak descent. I uh, recently just graduated high school, so that's cool. And yeah, I'm um, happy to be with you guys today. Who wasn't with us last time? Thank you, Joe Lou. Happy to have you here as always. Uh, my other youth, Mr. Milton Mabry, how are you today? And want to tell us a little something about yourself. I'm good, Chris. Um, my name is Milton Mabry. I'm from Hoopa. I graduated uh, high school last Friday, and I'm gonna be attending College of the Redwoods, and gonna transfer to Shasta after for heavy equipment. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you boys for coming back. I know uh, I had to call you guys late last night and to get you guys over here, but that's all right. I'm happy you guys are here. Uh, so it's not just me as our mentor today. We have uh, our other mentor, Ellen Colgrove is here with us as well. Ellen, why don't you introduce yourself and how are you doing today? Hey Chris and hey Milton and Joe. Um, thank you for coming on last minute. I really appreciate it. My name's Ellen Colgrove. I just graduated HSU with a bachelor's in Native American studies and child development. And I'm going on to do a master's in social work. And I'm Hoopa. I'm a Hoopa tribal member, but I'm also Yurok and Kaduk. And I'm really excited to have this discussion today. So let's get started. Great. Thank you for having, thank you for being here, Ellen. I'm happy to have you with us. And uh, I believe you are going to introduce our uh, special guest today. So I'll let you do that. So today we have Frank Juan on that's going to talk to us. Uh, Frank Juan is an award-winning Lakota hip hop artist, music producer, and performer for the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. As a Gates Millennium Scholar, he received a BA in Audio Arts and Acoustics from Columbia College, Chicago, and he has been featured in numerous media outlets, including ESPN, The Fader, MTV, and many more. Frank travels sharing his music and story with communities to educate and inspire Native and non-Native people through performances, keynotes, and workshops. To be Lakota means to be a good relative. As a Lakota artist, Frank Juan uses art others to be better relatives to each other to the land and to ourselves um so hi frank thanks for being on with us today how are you hello ellen uh i'll introduce myself in my language first mitaku yapi oyate trecha omani imachapelo hello relatives uh i just introduced my lakota name which is Oyate Trecha Obumani, which means walks with the young nation or walks with the new nation. And that's a name that was given to me um, in my home community on the Rosewood Reservation uh, by elders and ceremony long before I did what I do now. And we're going to talk a lot about that today, actually. But I'm honored to be on. Um, I've, I've been out to your guys' lands before, out to your res to perform and had a great time. I got some ceremony relatives from out that way. I'm really honored to have these two young men joining us. Sound like um, th there's some really awesome people. I'm um, honored to have you on, Alan, you and Chris. So, um, you know, I'm just uh, excited to be here. Uh, 
All right, so thank you for being here. Thank you guys for introducing yourself. And I guess we'll just jump right in it with the first question. Um, Frank, is music a passion for you or is it something more? Well, um, you know, music for me, uh, it's funny, a lot of people ask me if I, you know, did it to be famous or for attention. Um, but a lot of people don't don't know, I think, um, you know, the struggles I had to go through to even be where I am as an artist. A lot of what you see when it comes to artists is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that goes into even someone getting to the point of, you know, being an artist. But for me, my music, my music journey started when I was very young and music was a coping mechanism for me, actually, and still is. Um, you know, I was a really shy kid. I was really introverted. And, you know, unfortunately, also, I was I was bullied a lot at home um, by a handful of my cousins for a lot of reasons. And so I was really just kept a lot of things to myself, including how I felt and music um, at that time, you know, um, I didn't have a lot of things that made me feel good in life or made me, you know, kind of were an escape for me. And music was one of those. I started playing piano when I was around seven years old. Um, I come from a family of ranchers and rodeo people, actually. My mom and her sisters um, ran a ranch on my res, ran by Lakota women, and they did rodeo stock, too. And so I was kind of the black sheep in that I, I, I was drawn to music. Um, there's no uh, music people in my immediate family. But for some reason, it was just calling me. Um, I, I, I had an old piano in my elementary school classroom when I was a kid. And I just, you know, I was drawn to it and started just teaching myself. My mom got me a little battery powered keyboard when I was a kid. And um, I just kept learning, you know, music, like I said, was an escape. Um, I was also really into sports. So it was like music and sports were the two things that kind of, I think, were coping mechanisms, healthy ones for me throughout my life. I was really in basketball and music were my first loves, I tell people. And I was also into distance running. So, you know, those things combined kind of kept me grounded and centered. But, um, you know, the older I got, the more uh, music was like a lifeline to me. And I started saving up money to build a home studio when I was around 12 and 13 on my res. And, you know, I'm 30 now. We didn't get the internet until I was 15. So imagine my res is very rural. It's in the middle of nowhere. We used to have to drive two or three hours just to, you know, get to a, a store or a mall or to, you know, even, even um, fast food and stuff. So at the time, you know, I couldn't just hop online and look, uh, download a beat or hop on YouTube and find a beat to rap over. I didn't even know what to do. I had to teach myself how to do everything and buy all the gear from scratch. But I started um, building a home studio at 12. It just became another thing I think to focus on another healthy coping mechanism, just something to put my energy on and to also help me escape, you know, and so I started teaching myself to make beats and I built the home studio. And it became a place for um, a lot of my friends and relatives who were into that too, to um, have something healthy to do and a, and, a, and a healthy thing to escape with to now I you know um, I have a group of native artists that I do that with so I would say music is, has in the beginning was a, a tool to escape and a tool to survive and I think now it, it becomes a, a tool to educate a tool to inspire and also to help myself build a career now I I make a living off of my music you know I'm not rich certainly by any means but I pay my bills with it and and I get to do what I love and get to do cool things like this so um you know music was, was is a passion and it's always much more than that for me too yeah it must have taken a lot of courage to do something so different than the way you grew up or the way your family lives yeah for sure and, and even in the beginning you know like now um it's fortunate we live in a time where native people are finding success in a lot of fields including music but at the time um no one had really done what I did from my res yet and even people in my own family doubted me and were like you know why are you doing that it doesn't make sense because I was using my scholarship to be a doctor at first because like I said, I was really shy and introverted and I kept my music a secret. Like I didn't even tell anyone or putting, start putting my music out there until I was in my early 20s. For most of my life, it was just something I did for myself because like I said, it was a coping mechanism. It helped me feel good. And, and, and once I decided I was using my scholarship to kind of live everyone else's dream, you know, everyone was telling me to go be a doctor, but no one knew deep inside I had music. It was what I wanted to do. And once I started doing that, you know, even understandably people in my own family were like you're not gonna 
uh, succeed. You're going from being a, a, a doctor to being a rapper. Like those things don't really add up, but you know, my mom believed in me and I'll speak about that a little later, but um, you know, I was doing what I loved. And I think that that's what matters. So even when people were saying stuff, it didn't matter because I was doing what I loved at the end of the day. Yeah, thank you for the mentioning that because our kids have a lot of passions and goals and you're an example of someone who puts in the work and takes that passion and makes a career out of it and is happy now. Yes, for sure. And I, and, and I know that's in, built into one of your questions later, but it's like, you know, work at it every single day. And I believe as Native people, we could achieve anything we want to really. We're so talented. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Milton, do you have a question? Yeah. How has substance abuse influenced your music, your motivation to pursue a career in music and community work? That's another great question. Um, man, it's like substance abuse um, or addiction, I'll say too, has always been like this, uh, this ever present evil force, like a dark cloud that's been in my life, you know, throughout my whole life, even, um, even in my family members. And I think for me, looking back, I was the only one of my cousins that never, you know, slipped into alcoholism or yeah, I definitely struggled with substance abuse, but um, I was the only one of my cousins that, um, you know, never let it completely consume me. And that doesn't mean I'm any better, but looking back, I know it was my spirit and I was meant to do what I, I do now, but I have a great story. I think that kind of um, encapsulates everything I want to share about this question, how it's affected my life. So, um, you know, everyone in my family, uh, I laugh about it, but I, I laugh to keep from crying. Everyone in my family is addicted to something, you know, from um, minor stuff to like caffeine to, you know, I got cousins in prison for meth right now, people I grew up with. Um, but I, I got a younger cousin. He's like a little brother to me. He's super talented. He's one of the most talented rappers I've ever known. Um, and we started out together actually making music. Like I said, I was really shy and he was like the opposite of me. He was really outgoing. He was really charismatic. Um, he had a lot of friends, you know, he was a really social person, but uh, we were always really close. And music was one of the things that really brought us together when we started out as like, I was like 12, maybe 13. He was like 10, 11. We were just kids when we started writing little songs together, writing little raps to my beats. And then, um, you know, we got older and we kept doing it. It was more like a like a hobby, like I said, like a healthy hobby that, that, that you know, gave us something to do other than um, a lot of the other negative hobbies that were happening around our res at the time. And then um, when I when I turned around 19 and went to college, um, we actually started like building a little music scene on my res and finding success with our music we had formed a music group him and i and we called ourselves a lakota phrase from our from our culture nake nu la wa un, and that means i'm always ready at all times for for anything he was he's like my little brother you know and um around that time whenever we started finding success just on our res we started getting played on the local res radio and doing shows at um different different youth events on our res and um there were other groups too that that were finding success like i said uh, it was kind of like the first time we could make music on our res because we had laptops and then had the internet and the programs to do it and then we started making a little music scene and uh, around the same time that started happening uh, he really started slipping into addiction really bad, um, alcoholism, and he was addicted to pills at the time. And and him and I uh, had a fallout. We had a really bad fallout um, over that. And he, uh, he ended up going to treatment for a while, and, and I went off to school. And uh, he, he sobered up a bit, and then he came home. And I remember I came home from school, and um, we, we kind of like we're in a place where we weren't talking because you know, just uh, what he was going through and what I was going through, we were just really beefing at the time, which I think, you know, um, we were hurt people. And I think hurt people hurt people. Definitely. I was hurt and he was hurt. And we were just putting that hurt on each other at that time in our lives, kind of like brothers do sometimes. And um, I, I ended up going away to Chicago where I got my degree after the pre-med thing. And he ended up falling back into, you know, like partying and stuff. And then um, something happened that that changed both of our lives forever. And, um, and you know, I, I think about this often. So I was, I was in school and one of my aunties called me at 4 a.m. 
And anytime this auntie calls me at that hour, I know it's never good news. You know, it's, it's always something bad. So I answered it and, and, um, you know, my relative, she had told me my, my little brother, he's a cousin, but I call him little brother. He was out. It was his, uh, it was his stepbrother's birthday and they were partying back home on the res and uh, he was driving home and uh, him and his best friend, his best friend was riding shotgun. They were going back to his crib and him and his best friend had both had really tough lives. Actually, my little brother, his mom is my first cousin and she struggled with a lot of substance abuse and addiction too. And, and, and he kind of grew up at the party. So he just kind of kept it going the older he got. And so the, um, his friend had gone through the same thing and they were like really close cause they really didn't have, you know, good parents, stable home life, but they had each other and, and, and they were best friends and he was driving home and uh, he wrecked and his best friend died. And uh, what happened was the feds came and got him for manslaughter of his best friend and they locked him up and sent him away uh, to a federal penitentiary. And that's not the first time that's happened in my family, actually. I've had that exact same thing happens a lot on our res where there'll be a drunk driving accident or an accident involving, you know, someone dying and the feds will come in and um, use that as a way to then send our people to federal penitentiaries far away from home. Uh, he got sent to one in Cali, in Southern Cali, and uh, we were all so broken poor, we couldn't go see him. He was he was locked up for three years. But, you know, fast forward, um, or no, before he got locked up too, he had just become a father, you know, so he was a young father. And then he, and his baby wasn't even barely one years old. And then he got locked up. And uh, when he got out, he got out about two years ago. And, and when he got out, I didn't really know what to expect. Cause I've had, like I said, I had that exact same thing happen to some relatives of mine. I still got relatives in the feds right now for drugs, but um, you know, I've had relatives that got out and, and weren't the same in the worst ways and were never the same and just kind of kept going back in. But when he got out, he was completely 180 in the best way. Like, man, he, his story gives me hope. He sobered up. He came home. He, he, he became a good dad. He works for our tribe's radio station now. And um, we do ceremony together. We make music together. Actually, um, you know, uh, some uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, this year in March, I brought him out to Chicago where I'm based right now. Um, actually, for a week, we did an artist residency together. And, and um, we were out here for a week and we did writing workshops and shared our music and story with a halfway house program that's based on the south side of Chicago that I work with called Green Reentry. And a lot of those brothers um, had been through a lot of similar stuff that we go through on the res, like, you know, um, uh, you, you wouldn't believe it. And, and it was all it was all black brothers grew up in, in the south side of Chicago, worlds apart from from the res. But when we shared our stories and our music, me and my brother and just our story of healing and how, you know, he went through all that. And now we, um, you know, we, we our, our, our journeys kind of went like this. We separated for a long time. He got locked up. I stayed on my music path, but it came full circle and we came back together and, and we came back together around music. And that, that artist residency was the most powerful thing I'd ever done in my life. Just being able to go through that whole journey with my, my, my brother. And, you know, like I said, uh, looking back and we've talked about this and he shared how, you know, um, his addiction was what led him to our falling out and a lot of the dark things he did that eventually ended up him up in prison, you know. So I, I share that story to also say, you know, that's two different paths, but we ended up in the same place that week in sh South Side of Chicago sharing our story. I'm no better than him in that, you know, I, I, I didn't let those addictions grab a hold of me. I had music and I'm fortunate. I'm grateful I had music, that thing to grab onto. And I tried every chance I could to get him to use music the same way. And he did. And in my opinion, he's more talented than I am. He's one of the most talented rappers I've ever seen, you know, but, but he, he kind of slipped off the edge um, uh, one too many times, you know, and got, got caught up in some stuff one night, but, but you know, he's, he's, I'm no better than him. He's no better than me. And here we are um, getting to do what we love together again. And, and, and I'll share with you guys that, that, that week we did that, you know, like I said, just follow your heart, follow your passion. Um, it, it was a tough week of just us sharing our stories, sharing things we've been through, 
but it really helped a lot of people. We were even gifted like for real gold rings. He, my brother, he's like, man, we ne I never got a gold ring in my life. And now, you know, I, I got a gold ring and it came to more opportunities. A tribe in Minnesota reached out to us to do the same thing, you know? So, so I think there's a lot of redemption and healing too. If you really kind of, you know, push through it and persevere. And if you're comfortable finding ways of sharing that in community, I think there's a lot of redemption and, and, and beautiful opportunities in our healing. And I, and I just want to share that story because to me, you know, that's a, 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 an example of how substance abuse has impacted my family, but also how you can take all that and I think create something beautiful in the end, you know. Thank you for telling your story. I have a similar story. Last year, September 8th, I uh, hopped in with a drunk driver, got in a wreck during football season. Uh, after, everything after that was just been a, like, made me look at life different. But thank you for telling your story. I didn't get to be a part of the planning for today. I'm, so I'm glad I got to hear you speak today. And I think Joe has a question for you. Thanks, Milton. Appreciate that, man. Oh, yeah. Um, for many tribes, you song and instruments as a prayer for healing. Um, how has your culture influenced the way you make and work with music as a medicine? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and that actually leads into another crazy story. So I, I, I shared with y'all how I always used music as a healing tool, you know, and as, as I wrote songs to help me heal and help me cope. And it's still very much the case. So um, in February of this year, I had a, a really crazy incident happen to me. So I had a stress induced seizure for the first time in my life. And, um, you know, I, I have to do a lot of work to, to just make it happen as an independent artist and managing myself and just putting my own music out. And I think it just caught up to me for the first time in my life. And I ended up having a seizure and 911 had to be called. I was taken to a hospital on the south side of Chicago, um, you know, close to where I live. And um, I got a really bad uh, mistreatment because of uh, racism and ignorance. So when I went into the hospital, um, my partner was with me and trying to explain, you know, that she had just got come home from work and had um, found me passed out and then I had a seizure. But what had induced it that day, uh, I just started vomiting for some reason, just kept vomiting. I couldn't stop vomiting. I never had anything like that happen. But, you know, looking back, like I said, it was stress. But when I got to the hospital, they, um, for some reason, assumed I was smoking PCP and they would not believe that it wasn't drug induced until my blood test came back that it wasn't PCP. And um, so I came to in the hospital intubated with a tube down my throat, which wasn't supposed to happen. I wasn't supposed to come to and be conscious, but I came to and I freaked out because um, a year before that I had an accident scuba diving actually where I almost drowned. My tank um, ran out of oxygen on me 15 feet under the ocean and I, 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 I um, was drowning trying to get to the top. Luckily I lived, but I have a lot of just stuff about suffocating that freaks me out because of that. So imagine like, you know, I was out before I had the seizure. All I remember is passing out and then just it was like a dream coming to in the hospital and I had a tube down my throat and I couldn't breathe. And I instantly started panicking and freaking out trying to grab the tube. And um, the hospital marked me with combative disorder and they had several men hold me down and they strapped me into a bed with locked restraints and pumped me full of drugs, pumped me full of sedatives. Um, I was out for two days unconscious. I don't even really remember um, what happened to me, but I came to two days later in the hospital I was still really high off of sedatives. They gave me a spinal tap, I, um, which really messed with my memory. I had to be told what had happened to me. And my body was covered in bruises from head to toe. Like I looked like and felt like I'd been ran over by a truck just from them holding me down. And another crazy thing that happened was they saw my um, ceremony scars on my body because I'm Lakota. And I'm going to speak a little later how ceremony um, really helped me and saved my life too, going back to that when I was 19. But um, so I have scar scars on my body because uh, Lakota, um, in some of our ceremonies, we offer flesh for prayer. And so the hospital saw that and um, they assumed it was self-mutilation. Despite at that point, my mom and my sister had driven out from our res to be with me. They were telling them, no, this is like how we pray. This is a Lakota thing. Like a lot of Lakotas have these scars but they wouldn't believe in me. So um, I wouldn't believe my family. Uh, they were just, you know, assuming the worst every step of the way. 
And actually what happened when I came to on Sunday is they moved me from the ICU unit to the regular floor and they kicked my family out of the room and a psychiatrist came in and I was still really high off the spinal tap and the sedative. So I was really loopy and the psychiatrist started questioning me about my scars and he started questioning me about um, my records and history of seeing a psychologist because I, I, I've um, struggled with a lot of things like depression, anxiety, and PTSD from some things I experienced when I was a kid. Um, you know, uh, th things that I would use music to help me cope for. And I seen a psychologist for a couple of years and somehow they got my medical records and they, they looked at my scars and they assumed I was um, self mutilating and they were trying to send me to the um, um, the psych ward. And, and, and what was crazy about it was, like I said, I was still really loopy from all the drugs. And I was, they were trying to trip me up alone in a room. They kicked my family out, but I was able to, you know, kind of evade their questions. And what happened was when I became conscious, the doctor came in and told me um, they had actually done damage to my body from shooting that many sedatives into me and, and, and tying me into the bed and having men hold me down and bruising me up from head to toe. When, when they, they cause that much muscle trauma and put that much sedatives into young people's bodies at once, it can cause a spike in an enzyme in our blood. It's called the creatine kinase enzyme, the CK enzyme. And normal levels are between three and 500. And when I came to on Sunday, mine were over 40,000 and it was damaging my liver and kidneys. So basically I ended up having to stay in the hospital for a week while they pumped my body full of uh, IVs to flush out all the damage they had done to me. So I went in for a seizure and because of their ignorance, they ended up doing a ton of damage to my body. Um, it was one of the worst weeks of my life being locked up in the hospital. I, I couldn't leave that floor. I could barely move. I could barely get out the bed. My body was so beat up. Um, I, I didn't have fresh air for a week. You know, um, there were even some nights where I ordered meals from the hospital and they just straight up didn't even deliver the food, you know. So it was it was a really traumatic experience. And when I got out of that, which was just a couple months ago, um, you know, I really felt like my spirit had left my body. And um, that, that, that's kind of a Lakota teaching. Uh, Lakotas believe that, you know, in different traumas, your spirit can leave your body. Um, we're taught that right now we're just kind of like these, the old, old, the old schoolers would say we're like these meat bodies, these meat sacks inhabited by spirit. And anything you experience on this life is what your spirit learns and takes back. And um, they believe that also, you know, like there are times that your spirit can leave you if something crazy happens to you. Even if I think even if you're like triggered or something, it can leave you in fractions or pieces. But I really felt like my spirit left my body through all of that. Even just two days are just gone entirely. You know, I didn't even know what happened to me for two days. I was so drugged up and strapped into a hospital bed. And so uh, um, Lakota people believe in calling your spirit back. It's like a daily practice we do. I was taught in ceremony just um, to say your name and to just call your spirit back when you'd get home. Even like back in the day when they'd call their kids in from playing, they would call their name four times after the kid ran inside to call their spirit back. And so after all that, I was like, man, I, my spirit's gone. Like I need to call my spirit back. But I knew I needed to write a song and do a song to do it. I needed to do something extra. And that's where um, being a musician, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a songwriter, but also playing instruments helps me express myself without words. And sometimes I feel like words get in the way of what I need to express and how I feel, especially because English isn't our native language. You know, I'm not fluent in Lakota, my language, but the more I learn, the more I realize that that language is what, what, what feels right to me. You know, English doesn't always capture how I feel, but music does. And so I've never had this happen before when I came home from the hospital. I stepped out on the back deck of my apartment and the song was already in my head, like entirely. It was already there, um, note for note, line for line. Um, usually I have to work on songs, but I'm going to I'm going to play that song for you guys on flute. This is the I call this the uh, calling your spirit back song. And this is for all of us that I think people go. We've all you know gone through traumatic things my whole family. And I think our spirit can leave us sometimes in those traumas. And um, I think it's important to call your spirit back because sometimes your spirit can stay gone, you know, and I think it creates a void sometimes and we fill that void with unhealthy things. But I think, you know, um, getting more in touch with my spirit and my spirituality helps me stay gra grounded. 
So the other cool thing about this was, um, you know, I introduced you all um, to my Lakota name, Oyate Trecha Obmani. So when I call my spirit back in my language, I say, Oyate Trecha Obmani Uwo. Uwo means come here in Lakota. So what I did with this song is because I can't really sing, you know, I'm a rapper. I like saying it through the float flute. So you're going to hear it. It's like, Oyate Trecha Obmani Uwo. So like note for note, you're going to hear me um, sing my Lakota name in my language through the flute. And like I said, I wrote this song to call my spirit back. This is the calling your spirit back song. So that was the calling your spirit back song. And um, I kind of showed you guys how I sang my my name through that song. But when I played that, I played that line um, seven times to uh, the seven directions because Lakota people acknowledge seven directions when we pray west, north, east, south, up, down, and all around. So again, I think just looking at the way our ancestors did things and adapting that to your own way of doing things, even your, your coping routines and the things that help you survive, I think helps us, um, helps us just draw strength and power from all of that. So, you know, that's an example of how I, I use um, music as healing and kind of looked at the way my ancestors did that too and apply that to the songs I write. That was really awesome. Thank you. Um, when I was listening to your um, latest album, the flute album, I could tell like the emotion that came with that story and the flute. Um, it just it meant a lot to you and that it's really important that you use that as kind of like, like you said, like a coping mechanism. And thanks for sharing with us because I know that's probably really hard to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, the crazy thing is, you know, I realized for our ancestors, um, the, the line was kind of blurred. Our songs were prayers. A lot of our songs were prayers. And that's one of those songs that I feel like became a prayer for me. And every morning when I wake up, I play, I step outside and I play that song to call my spirit back. So it has become like a mantra, like a prayer that I do every day. So, you know, for anyone listening, I, I think it's a really healthy practice to call your spirit back every day in your own way, whatever you call yourself and call your spirit. Um, I, I, th I think it'll help you be grounded more every day. Mm -hmm. um, in your stories, you mentioned, or so far you've mentioned a few people that have influenced your life. And so I want to ask, who are the people in your life that have pushed you to become the person you are today? That's a that's a great question. And honestly, uh, the exact list is too long to name. So I'll just, you know, maybe share a few stories. But one of them, the biggest being my my mother, you know, I was raised by a single mom, um, kind of raised by my mom and aunties uh, and my grandma, all my cousins, we grew up together, we all kind of had had deadbeat dads, our dads kind of bailed on all of us, I joke and say we were the no dad tribe. And we were being raised by all of our moms. And so, you know, my single mom made a lot of sacrifices for me. And I was really grateful, too, that I also had someone to be there for me when I was growing up. And, you know, our relationship definitely wasn't perfect. 
there were times where she really hurt me and abandoned me. And there were times that I really hurt her because I was hurt, you know. So I feel like um, me and my mother are always in a state of repairing and growing our relationship in, in any way we can. But whenever I decided to stop, you know, being on a pre-med track and to use my scholarship for music and kind of take that big gamble and take that big leap. And, and like I said, I kept my music a secret for the most part. So th these were also, um, it was a big leap in that, you know, a lot of people didn't even know I, I made music or wanted to be an artist. But I remember sitting my mom down and having a conversation with her where I was like, mom, I, I, I'm not going to do this pre-med thing anymore. Like I, I'm, I, I don't, I don't, I don't find joy or I'm not getting anything out of this, but also at the same time that year I had gone through a lot of traumatic stuff. I was 19 and I was um, one of the most depressed and suicidal I'd ever been in my life. And so um, that was when also I decided to return to ceremony. And so, you know, I started going to ceremony more um, and, and going to ceremony helped me realize that I, I needed to follow my, my passion and follow my heart and, and do the music no matter what. And so whenever I, I told my mom I wanted to do music, she she believed in me. And, and honestly, I didn't believe in myself yet. And back home, um, th there were a handful of mentors, some older folks who um, helped me establish, you know, a, a business. I have an LLC, helped me get a tribal business license and helped me just to get things in order so I could start um, you know, building a future and a career for myself with my music, because I did not know what I was doing. Um, no one had done what I was doing before. I was just kind of figuring out as I went. But um, I had a lot of mentors along the way that, that I think saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and pushed me and pushed me out of my comfort zone and, you know, pushed me to do things and perform and speak in places that I had never even considered that, that I think helped me um, get to where I'm at. You know, so, so I think uh, mentors are, are, are very important. A, a, another mentor, um, the, you know, my mom back home, um, you know, a, a couple of uncles and aunties back home on the res, but also some people in Chicago. When I got out here, I had a black professor, this black woman named Claudette Roper, um, my first semester here. Um, she really helped me realize the strength in my music and story. I didn't believe in myself. I didn't think that what I had to offer the world was, was really worthy. And she showed me that it was and she showed me that I was really unique as a native artist. And, and, and um, you know, so definitely along the way, I've had a lot of mentors. And I think um, that for me, that's going to lead into uh, the next song I want to share on the flute with you all. So this song that I'm going to do is uh, called Wopila, which is the Lakota word for thank you. And I wrote this song for someone who helps me, I think in a different way. He was, a, he was a spiritual leader for me. He was a medicine man. His name is Roy Stone Sr. But he passed away, unfortunately, in 2018. But I started going to him for ceremony when I was 19. And up until that point in my life, I was disconnected from my culture, from ceremony, from my language. Um, I really didn't know what it meant to be Lakota. You know, I just knew what it kind of that I was native and I was growing up on a res. But my, some of my aunties and uncles started um, going to sweats with him. And at that time, like I said, when I was 19, I was really depressed. I was really suicidal. I was actually planning on um, ending my life. And um, my little brother, who I shared the story about earlier, that was actually at the peak of him and I um, kind of being at war with each other and the peak of our beef and the peak of his addiction. And it was right before he had... Um, got in that accident and got sent off so it was like just a lot of things in my life were going wrong and, and going bad at the time and it seemed like there was no hope even in music you know I wasn't really getting booked or anything like that but you know I did it because it made me feel good but it, um, I know we've probably all been to points where it seems like everything lost its life and its color and I was just trying to figure figure out why I should keep going and I didn't seem to have a lot of reasons I felt like at the time and I started uh, going to his place to do sweat and just do ceremonies. And I decided to do a, a, a humblecha ceremony, a fasting ceremony, where we go out on a hill with our pipe and we um, fast for anywhere from one to four days. It's really hard. It's a big sacrifice. You kind of got to put down a lot of worldly possessions and um, make a lot of sacrifices to even do that ceremony. But it seemed like a last option. And I did it and I prayed for answers. And it brought me a dream that changed my life and saved my life forever. 
you know, and um, brought me a dream that still helps me today. And it showed me the power in our ceremonies and the power in spirituality and the power in prayer and the power in our culture. And um, he gave me my Lakota name. So he's also like a, a father to me, you know, in ceremony, this man. Um, and he's helped a lot of people from my res and, and from my community. He was an old medicine man that barely spoke Lakota, you know, but he, he did ceremony for a lot of people. And like I said, he passed away in 2018. And um, when he when he died, it was a big loss for me, for my whole community, you know, having his place to go to pray and do ceremony every summer was something that really helped keep me grounded. And, um, you know, I haven't had that for the last couple of years. So it's been hard to find new coping mechanisms, but I found some new places to pray. And I wanted to say thank you to him for saving my life. He saved my life more than once. I definitely know I'd be dead without him. And another thing about um, how he helped me was when I decided to do ceremony and um, in Lakota culture, when we do um, ceremony, you pick up the uh, chinupa, the pipe that we used to pray with. We fill it with red willow bark mixed with tobacco sometimes, but usually just red willow bark from back home, you know, and we use that to pray. But once you, be, you pick up that pipe, you commit to living a, a clean life, living a good life, including substance free. And so, um, you know, I, I, once I, I decided to do that, it was really another reason for me to stay sober as much as I could. And actually what's beautiful about that is when I, when I did that, when I became a pipe carrier and decided to do ceremony, that was also the thing that um, prompted my mom to become sober. You know, my mom, um, my mom drank and I wouldn't say she was like always alcoholic, but she definitely struggled with it at times. Um, and my whole family has, but whenever I decided to um, do ceremony, my mom decided to become completely sober too and has been since then. So it was, a, that was another beautiful thing that I, I didn't realize was going to happen. Just, you know, kind of um, choosing a spiritual life and a spiritual path. But when, um, you know, like I said, he saved my life and the, there were many reasons how, how, and so I wanted to say thank you to him. So I decided to do it in a song because my world has been a lot darker since he's been gone. But, um, you know, I know I would be dead without him. I would be I would have slipped off the edge and, and I, I would have either taken my own life or got caught up with something that ended up killing me in the end, um, which, you know, happened to a lot of my relatives, some of my cousins um, and a lot of my friends. And so, you know, I, I think about them often and, and also in my work and doing stuff like this, like I said, I'm no better than them. Um, but I think um, my life and my music and my path was given to me for a reason to share these stories and to help people in any way I can. So uh, this song is called Wopila. This is Thank You. Um, and this is for uh, the person that saved my life back home. Thank you. So that's Wopila. Uh, that's dedicated to Roy Stone Sr. from my home res, but also all the mentors. There's some mentors on this call. All of our mentors, young and old, from the grandmas and grandpas, the aunties and uncles, the moms and dads, the sisters, big sisters, all the way down to our youth mentors, you know, because um, now some, some of my biggest inspirations are our kids and my own nieces and nephews who, um, you know, um, mentor me in their own way. So that was for all the mentors. Thanks for that. Um, your when it goes into the like the louder notes, it kind of just like tones it down, but you can still like slightly hear. Okay, I'll, I'll adjust my volume on my end. Thanks for telling me. Okay, yeah, and um, 
We also have a comment from Ju or Lou Hill. Um, they say, you are so inspiring. Remembering you as a little boy at uh, Stone Sundance. So that's a comment that we got on Facebook. Wow, that's the, the place I was talking about, that that was the place where we'd go. That's so funny. I've been going there since I was a kid, like I said. So that's beautiful. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Shout out to whoever said that. Yeah. And um, also, I want to ask um, Joe and Milton this question also. Who are the people in your life that pushed you to become the person you are today? Whoever wants to go first. I'll go first. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of people. We got Chris, um, and all, all my coaches, Tashoni Rice, my parents, of course, Sunshine, Travis Sims, Willie Sims, um, Chelsea Gibbons, just like a lot of all my coaches mainly, they all want to see me do good things in life and they want me to go to college. So that's what I'm planning on doing. Joe? Um, pretty much for the, the beginning for me, I guess it was just kind of like um, just my parents, just when they were there for me, it's kind of in the beginning, like the start of my life. Um, just me knowing that they were, you know, at least trying and trying to be there. And I just, I, I mean, I looked up to my mom so much up to a point to where I mean, I seen how much, you know, how much strength she had. And even when things were tough and we had, we had no food, we, we, we had, you know, no electricity, no nothing, how much she still strived to just try to do better and try to make things as, as, as good as, you know, things were. And just seeing her just to, just to how much adversity she was facing at the time, you know, we didn't have money all the time, you know, she always would push to be stronger and try to try to make her kids, feel better and try to put herself above everyone else and just she was just so strong and this it was just crazy how much she just pushed herself extra just to make us feel feel better feel good and make us still feel comfortable and just my coaches like Milton said just all the people was ever just came up and said um just just some certain things you know whatever word they had to say I like to say Joe Marsh was kind of a very important influence in my life too I was kind of at that stage where it was like my sophomore year where I could have went this way or that way. And um, he kind of, he kind of made it to where I went on the right path instead of the bad one at that early age. So that I, I thank him a lot for that. And just, just everyone who's, you know, had a bigger impact on my life to where I really needed it at a younger age. It's, it was awesome. Just uh, those people are out there and make that happen. Nice. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, actually, I, I, I kind of want to jump in. I have a request. I didn't plan on doing this, but Joe talking about your mom, you know, holding you down. I have a song that I actually wrote for my mom um, on the bass. Can I share that with you guys? So, so I didn't, I just plan on doing some flute, but I'll, I'll do some, um, some bass in, in, in some of my songs too. So let me see if I can turn on this bass. Can y'all hear that? All right, cool. So um, like I said, you know, music is a coping mechanism for me. And one of the ways it is for me is learning instruments. You know, if I'm having a hard time, um, I'm not going to lie. After I went through the stuff in the hospital and the almost drowning accident that I shared with y'all, I really had a tough time, you know, and I really needed something to help me get through it. And learning new instruments was one of those ways. And so I learned how to play the bass and, um, you know, uh, uh still am, am every day learning something new about music so i'm gonna get the bass going here and i was raised by i was raised by a single mother and she um you know i, I shared that with you guys earlier and uh she made a lot of sacrifices for me to be where i'm at and so when i was in college actually around some of your guys's age i was in school at the time i was in college i was on scholarship I was from a poor res and I was a starving artist. So I was like three ways broke. And my mom's birthday was coming up and I wanted to do something special for her for her birthday. Um, but I didn't have any money. She's not really into parties or anything like that. And so I decided to write her this song as a birthday present. And I released it on her birthday in 2011. And it's still one of my most popular songs. I just actually released a, an in-studio performance of me doing this and playing flute and showing how I play all the different instruments on it. Um, it's called Like a Rock. So I'm gonna do that song for you all today here on the bass.
89, we said hello, he said goodbye, daddy left when I was three, and made us cry, you and I, we had to make it, you found a way, drama came, and friends left, but mama stayed, through everything, all the fights, and all the shame, all the change, I hate that man, don't want his name, told my mom, that I'm a one, couldn't understand, all the things going on between her and my fam, but I was stubborn, I know that I made things hard, you always said son, I know you're gonna take things far, believe that, I need that, in dark times, I think of what you did for me and my heart shines, you took my hand up this mountain, made it your climb, so when I shine, mom you shine, yeah, a single mother with the yard stack, you found a way, one day I'll bring it all back, lives all my life, just me and you, Every single storm that you see me through Cause I ain't have a dad and we ain't need no man Raised by a woman, you made me a man I gotta leave home cause my heart will roam I gotta let you know that you're not alone Our love is like a rock but you will be my stone Forever in my heart, forever you're my heart You always gave me what I needed, somehow always found the time Single parent, it's apparent that you stayed up on your grind I remember you were put me first it was hard but you said son it could be worse and you were right it's funny looking back the days were sunny you kept me smiling even though we didn't have the money that other people did somehow you made it happen i promised mom that i'm gonna do it when i'm rapping because you took me everywhere in my cap in my backpack 20 years later now i'm rapping and snapbacks i'm rocking the long braid we came a long way you kept me on the right road away from the wrong way forever i'm grateful for the life you gave the tears that we cried the sacrifice you made yeah a single mother with the yard stack you found a way one day i'll bring it all back lives all my life just me and you every single storm that you see me through because i ain't have a dad and we ain't need no man raised by a woman you made me a man i gotta leave home because my heart will roam i gotta let you know that you're not alone our love is like a rock and you will be my stone forever in my heart forever you're my heart you're my stone so that one goes out to all the moms all the grandmas all the aunties big sisters all the strong indigenous women that are the backbones of our society thank you thank you That was so cool. That was like so cool. Um, thanks for sharing that with Joe and with us and with our community. Um, I think the next question will be from Milton. What are your goals for the future, whether your community or personal? Um, you know, that, that's another great question. I'm going to take these headphones off. Um, and I just want to also say shout out to Milton and Joe for being on that song I just shared. I didn't plan on sharing, but Joe, your story about your mom inspired it because I heard you say some things, exact, almost the exact same things I said in that song. So I was like, hey, I want to share this song. But um, when it comes to goals, I think for me, a lot of my goals can kind of be um, sourced back to or traced in or rooted in the fact of just um, of me trying to figure out new ways of using um, my passion and my gift and the things I love, music uh, and, you know, things like this, sharing my story with people to keep helping people that I care about, people that I love. So, you know, right now I, I said I'm very fortunate. I'm able to do this sort of stuff for a living, to um, perform and my music for a living to put out music for a living i'm not rich but i pay the bills i hope to just keep growing that as a career keep expanding my audience and and just keep finding new ways to keep um doing what i love for indian country too you know um actually whenever i was out in your community i i did a, a q and a at at a college and um there were some youth there and a, a kid asked me he he said you know do you um would you ever collab with an artist like Drake or, you know, he was talking about like kind of big mainstream artists. And, and I, I mentioned to him how 
um, you know, that isn't my goal. You know, I, I don't want to be um, that big. I, I wouldn't survive. You know, I think there's a reason why a lot of people that end up becoming famous uh, fall to addiction or suicide or end up dying and self-destructing. It's a tough lifestyle. And even the little bit of success that I've had, you know, has been a test. So I don't, I don't want to be um, on a level like Drake or anything. I want to be able to keep doing what I can do for Indian country. And like I said, expand my audience and be able to keep making a living off of it. Um, you know, and, and one of the ways I do that is with an artist collective called Dream Warriors. And we're a group of native artists around my age, similar story to me. We've all suffered with um, things from foster care to all sorts of substance abuse and addictions, depression, you know, but we, we use music as our, our tool to, to help us navigate that and get out of that. And it brought us together. We, we formed an artist collective. We created a scholarship for young native people. Anyone listening, you want to be an artist, look up the Dream Warrior Scholarship. We literally used to just cut the check and like do paper applications, but it got picked up by Indian Education Inc. It has an online form now. Do donors get tax write-offs. So it took on a life of its own. Um, Dream Warriors, we, we, we go out and we do res tours, similar to when we were out in Bear River. Um, we, we perform at different schools on reservations. And at, we recently been doing webinars to raise money for native families um, for COVID relief and we were able to relate uh, raise over thirty thousand dollars to distribute to native families across all the reservations in the U.S. and so you know those are just examples of things I'm doing but want to keep doing and expanding on so just you know when I said defining my own definition of success from an indigenous lens I think that's what I mean and just keep finding new ways to do what I love for the people I love um, and, and I think that's an indigenous way of looking at success. Thanks for sharing that resource. Um, everyone write it down, Dream Warriors <laughs> online and check yes, it Dream out. Dream Warriors Scholarship. And, and if you want to book us too, like if you like what you saw, um, you know, uh, we, we love to visit communities and perform too. But you can check out our website, dreamwarriors.co. It's all on there. Okay. And um, let's see, we only have three more minutes and we have one more question and Joe is gonna ask it. Yeah, um, so I was just wondering to know what advice you would like to like give to the youth who are looking to make music and make a career from it because obviously, you know, you inspire a lot of people and I was, I was just getting wanting to get some insight on how you would want to, to give advice on that yeah for sure man so um you know i would say number one uh do, do something you love like i know a handful i know people who join music because they want to be famous or known and they never end up lasting all the people that i know that make it as music artists are doing the music because they love the music so i would say you know if you can find something you love whatever it is and and do it no matter what but work at it every single day, you know, like I'm not glorifying overworking. I'm trying to balance, but I had a stress induced seizure. I have to work so hard to do what I do, you know? And so I, I, I work at music every day and I practice every single day because I'm doing what I love, you know? So it's like, it's like similar when I was in love with sports, I love playing basketball. So practice doesn't feel like practice because you're, you're having fun the whole time you're doing it, you know? And so it's, it's a similar thing with, I think, a career path or a passion, find what you love and do it no matter what. And I would also say, you know, um, look towards our ancestors and our culture as much as you can, because the more I, I, I look towards the way our ancestors did things, the more I'm able to create music and art that a lot of different people can relate to, you know, not just native people. Um, and I think the way our ancestors did things, whether that be our language, our songs, our dances, our ceremonies, um, there was a lot of truth and a lot of healing in that. And um, there's a lot of truth and healing in that for me, the more I integrate that into my everyday life and my routines, you know, and I would also encourage everyone to, you know, music's my healthy coping mechanism, but, you know, if you can find your healthy coping mechanism, make it your passion, make it your career, make it your life, make it your path if you can, and find ways to, to use that to, to help others. And I think that'll lead you down a good path. Thanks for um, listening to us and talking to us and thanks for sharing your story and your music. Um, that a lot to us and 
we're very appreciative that you're here. Thank and you. And I think I'm, Chris has a question. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, before I wrap everything up, first off, I want to know where you got that shirt because the Baby Yoda shirt is awesome. Uh, Shane Walker wanted to know where you got it too because that's dope. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so the shirt, actually my homie, he's a, a, a Tewa artist from the Southwest, Dwayne Koya Wena Art. So um, if you go on my IG, I'll put it in my story too, but I tagged him. I don't know if he's still doing around, but he did this painting and then did some shirts. And so um, he's actually, we've done some merch collabs together. He, he's designed a merch shirt for me. He's a dope artist. But if you go to my IG and, and you see this designer, um, I, 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 I'll tag him too. So. Sweet. Uh, who we knows? We might get that for him. Say that again, Ellen. Where do we get some merch at? Oh, um, so you can just hit me on social media. Um, I, I go through my band camp. You can order, but if you want to just hit me directly, send me a DM. I got shirts, CDs, stickers, or if you look at um Frank Juan band camp, you can order officially through there too. Either way, I sign and um send every every merch order. So you could check me out online. And all my music's on iTunes, Spotify. If you like the flute stuff you just heard, I just put out a flute album with those stories. So um you could check it out on all music streaming platforms. Yeah, Frank, I would also uh, like to thank you for that song, song you shared. It was, it was very beautiful. It was awesome. Thanks, man. And um, uh, shout out to your mom, too. Say thank you to your mom for raising a good one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we are about to wrap everything up here. Uh, before we do wrap up, I want to know, uh, Frank, do you have anything else to say? Or the boys or Ellen has anything else to say before we kind of wrap everything up? I'll just say Wopi Latanka, big thank you to all the organizers, everyone tuning in. It's always an honor when I do anything with uh, Two Feathers, so um, it's been a pleasure again. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, Joe, uh, you have anything else you want to say before we wrap everything up? Yeah, just, um, just a really big shout out. Thank you, you know, for hopping on. It uh, means a lot to us to talk to other people. You know, just just it's really awesome that you do what you're doing. Thank you for that. Amazing. Meld, how about you? I just want to say thank you for being here with us. I appreciate it. Sweet. Uh, Ellen, anything else you want to say before we wrap all this up? Um, I think I've already talked about how appreciative I am of Frank for being here. And Milton and Joe, thank you again. You guys did so good. And yeah, everyone have a good day. I guess it's sunny now, so. <laughs> we brought the See sun. All right. Thank you all again. Peace, guys. See you guys.